Now, our final session um, is a debate with Q&A from the floor and with uh, Bernie Newham, Newnham, um, Gra sorry, Graham Reed, chairman of ITTP, Bernie Newnham from ITTP, and Susan Scotcher, also a founder of ITTP and at Kingston University. Yeah. Um, and um, we felt that um, a lot of issues have been raised and it's important that people can ask the ITTP what they're doing about it and also add to the list you know, of things that uh, need to change. So has anyone got uh, any question that they'd like to ask the ITTP. Oh, yes, mm -hmm. right. Um, <laughs> gentleman there, yes. <laughs> Don't make it too difficult. Okay. Uh, sorry, following on from our last... Oh, Can you sorry. say who you are? Sorry. Stephen Rappasholi, Transparent Zebra, former teacher, uh, teacher of Ohm's Law, by the way, is <laughs> to do with voltage, current, and resistance. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, it, it seems to me, we were just talking about the, um, in Malcolm Gleick's book, uh, Outliers, or is it Blink, they talk about 10,000 hours to become good at anything. It just seems to me that nobody's going to get um, an expert at anything after a three-year course if you need to do it in 10 years' worth of learning. So if, um, uh, isn't it, you know, how do we train at university, then what do we need to do afterwards, and, uh, you know, what sort of progression is that? Is that maybe what the challenge is for you guys. You want me to answer that? <laughs> well, well, I'll go first. Go on, yeah. um, but this is the whole issue with the industry, isn't it, really? I mean, how, I mean, in my own example, I was a, a camera trainee at the BBC, and I, and I always say it took me a good three years of four days a week of throwing a pet about the studio before I really became any good a ped operation, uh, three years, four days a week. Now, the, the issue we have with the industry now, of course, is that opportunity, as we heard this morning from Chris Miller, for example, that opportunity doesn't exist now. And I think the same for whether you're going to be a lighting director, a sound supervisor, a floor manager, a makeup artist, whatever, or a PA. And this is the issue which we really have to sort of nail down somehow, is how, where will the next PA comes from? where would the next Fisher Boom operator come from? Because, you know, it takes a long time to, to operate a Fisher Boom, for example. And I did it in my sound train when I was at BBC as a trainee. I did a boom on the Likely Lads, which some of you may remember that programme. And, and it really brought home to me how very, very hard that particular skill is. Now, who are training the next lot of Fisher Boom operators? And it takes a long time to become really good at operating the Fisher Boom. And yet, lots of programmes still have them, like Mrs Brown's Boys, for example, has three booms, I believe, on that show. So who are we going to train the next set of, of, of Fisher Boom operators? Who are we going to train the next set of PAs who can bark out shot call timings all at the same time under a really stressful live um, situation? And that is our concern. Now, and, I, and, I, and, I, and the issue is, I, I think, there isn't an answer. Unless industry like Sky or BBC or Channel 4 or whatever really invests time and money in training Fisher Boom operators, PAs, lighting directors, in a few years' time when people like us, not that Susan, she's too young, but people like us you know, eventually say, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to sit in a bar in, in Devon for the rest of my life, you know, where is that going to come from? And who's going to replace us and Fisher Boom operators when they all retire? And the, the problem is, that I don't think there's an answer. Because people do need a long time to develop and hone their skills as a PA, a vision mixer, a Fisher Boom operator, a PED operator. And if, if we had the answer, we would say, this is what you need to do. Do this. But we don't. We just, we, we're just trying to as an organisation, really flag up the, the major issue there is down the road when people like us, oldies, retire, and, and, and Barry, who, who could do, you know, the Fisher Boom, you know, very easily, in and out, wide shot, in for the close, up for the wide shot, in for tight sound, all that sort of amazing stuff that Fisher Boom operators do, or PAs who, who count ten things all at the same time. So, uh, the answer is to, I mean, I, I don't know, maybe you can carry on, but I don't know either. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, but we need to wake up as, as an industry that there is this problem. I 
think you might find there are some people in the audience that actually don't know what a fissure boom is. But then you can tell and me. and <laughs> if that's the problem, can you imagine the trouble a student who thinks, what is my career going to be? They wouldn't know that that actually was a career opportunity. Mm -hmm. So this is where a wider range of skills will give the, the opportunity to like learn. And like PAs, indeed. I mean, I mean, I don't know how many students think, I really want to be a PA when I leave university, or even know what a PA's job actually is. Yes, absolutely. You know, and, and I think that is part of the problem. You know, we, yeah. people don't know what PA operator, a PA actually does, especially mm -hmm. in things like Come Dancing or X Factor, or in my case last month, though, um, um, Miss World. And, and, and industry really needs to wake up to that. And I, and I know a lot of you here are, in, are university people, and I don't necessarily think it's a university problem. It's an industry problem who should be investing in you to train boom operators, yes. PAs, mm -hmm. pet operators, and give them the time to spend three years kicking a pet out of the studio. Mm -hmm. you know, and so they, when they do a live TV show, they feel confident that they can do a pet. I mean, keep moving a pet is actually quite easy. It's up, down, left and right. You know, that's all there is to it, really. But if you try and do it on, on a come dancing or expat, it's a really hard job because it's that pressure of operating a pet Crab left bit, crab right up a little bit, you know, on, on a live show. And that is where it becomes really, really hard. And, and you'll sweat, you've got to pulp your arm, but you know, your heart's going to do it. And we need to give people that experience and that time to, to, to nurture. I, I find us as ITTP, here we are, Graham's a cameraman, I'm a retired producer, Susan lectures at a university, blah, blah. <laughs> I find us creeping on into the world of politics, uh, <laughs> talking to various people today. So the, the Scottish guy, the Glasgow University chap, still here, yes, talking about a particular way of working with the local industry <coughs> and the local government to twist the understanding of government from giving money over here for this, which is the wrong thing, to putting money over here for this, which is the right thing. And someone else earlier was talking about the, the levy, the industry levy in the film industry, where I don't know who does it, but someone has to put a load of money into all those trainees you see on the 53 minutes worth of credits at the end of a film. It's time the broadcast industry woke up and did that because otherwise when we fall off the perch, it isn't gonna work. Um, I don't think they have yet. And I think it may be that if you don't shout enough, nothing happens really. And we haven't shouted at all yet. I don't think anyone <laughs> shouted. <to> shout. <laughs> I think it may be you know, that we're gonna turn into the people who shout in the next while, well, well, some people another. would say that the BBC has a responsibility as I a public broadcaster BBC... funded by us all. Well, absolutely. I, I, I do not understand. There's no one here from BBC training, I assume, because it doesn't really exist anymore. And Rob, and... Lots of ex -BBC. Sorry? Lots of ex -BBC training. Yes. Yes, well, yeah, we were, we were all that. Yes, speak, madam. And, and... So the BBC are actually coming to Elstree next week about their apprenticeship programme. Yeah. They, the... they, um, they seem to be wanting to... The thing is about the BBC training, it used to be that the BBC training industry, as Ros says, we pay the licence fee, mm. and part of the licence fee was put into paying... A, put it, it was in the BBC's charter at one point, I don't know if it still is, it says you will train the industry effectively. Mm. It didn't matter that they went, went off to ITV or anywhere else, you trained them. Mm. So we all got trained by the BBC, you know, largely most of us stayed, but other people went off here and there, and it, it's a... You know, it's the British Broadcasting Corporation. It ought to be doing its job, and it's not. The, the BBC does still have training. They are paid for courses that yeah. you would go on. Mm. They're not part of your job. No, not part of yes. training. And in fact, you know, BBC Evesham, there's some great pictures on the internet of BBC Evesham where we went to train covered in old ivy and weeds and things like that because nobody's doing it anymore. It does take on apprentices, you know, a very small number. But what it's doing is, is reacting to a requirement, their own personal requirement, we need six engineers in CAR next year, therefore we'll have six apprentices. It's not taking on the, the role it used to have, which was there's an industry here and it needs training and we're the British Broadcasting Corporation, which it used to have. And, and that's why something like what we're trying to do is hopefully going to maybe bridge that gap a little bit. The idea of the ITTP approved seals, just as your first question said, is that what is the standard that people are actually looking for? And we heard this from this morning, that all the people in industry said, yeah, it'd be great to know, it'd be great to have a technical person. You know, when we employ them, we want them to be that standard. We want to know that they can actually throw that ped around to that level and know how to stand and behave in a studio or in an outside broadcast environment. 
when, if they get to that level, then there could be a stamp of approval, which would be the ITT approved skills and have that separately for each of the craft skills. So not trying to cover it all with one, but trying to give them individual skills that they can attain so that when the employer is looking to that person, looking at their CV, saying, well, you've been to university like the rest of them have been to university. How do I know how good good is? You know, I'm good with a camera. What exactly that means. So hopefully by creating something with the ITP approved skills, we will create a level, just as the BBC created a level. We knew when you came out of Evesham, I came out of Evesham, BBC broadcast engineer, I was an operator. I was a, a, I was a technical operator. So again, I had to do vision mixing to a certain, la certain standard. I did sound mixing to a certain standard. I've been trained by the BBC in all of these areas. So I was BBC approved. So we're creating, hopefully, a new standard that we can all get really excited about. Do we know why the BBC, I mean, I know the BBC has internal politics like no other organization <laughs> apart from the NHS. But I mean, <laughs> I remember when I worked for the BBC, I used to say, there should be a GCSE on working for the BBC and understanding all the bureaucracies and everything. It's unbelievable. But the point being, why are they withdrawn from training now? Is it a bean it, counter thing or it's not worth it's the money? They're withdrawing for every, from everything, effectively. Oh, Bernie. They have, they have, they have withdrawn. There are no camera crews, there is no OB trucks. There's no, I think there's still sound OBs. There's so little of the BBC massive technical infrastructure left now. Yeah. Um, and I think it's all part of the same thing. I don't know. I, I, if I knew what it was, I could probably write that an article in the Times about it and say, this is what it is. But I don't. And I don't think anyone else does either. So isn't one of the things that the ITTP ought to be moving on from, given all the points that have been made here, um, you know, and I know you've been, been lobbying as well, but you really got to lobby the politicians to Actually, understand yeah, exactly that yeah, if exactly this indus these come, creative yeah. industries are worth yeah. more yeah. than £70 billion pounds yes, a year, yes. they're not going to go on being. Yes, I think that's exactly that. We will turn after this one, as people talk to us, and have they been talking to us today, I think we're about to become politicians, amongst other things. Well, I didn't we, we set out actually, this morning thinking that. We way. have actually spoken to yeah. the Minister of Skills oh, that's right, have, in yeah. universities, yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and they were yeah. very supportive. I mean, you know, it's great to know they're supportive. And Prince Charles too. But they are politicians, <laughs> so they're going to be supportive. But we have, been, we, we have been there and talked to them, and we will go back again. And hopefully getting the feedback from you about the conference will give us more ammunition to help develop this. Because if this is something that you want as well, then it gives us more ammunition to go ahead with this and that they need to get more involved and perhaps that's where the pockets are that can help fund it. Okay, question here. Yeah. Quick, come on, come on, come on, come on, run. Uh, Phil Berry from uh, Great Yarmouth um, uh, UCS. Um, Again, you're saying about these standards um, uh, and your ITV standards that you're going to put across, but you've got um, different levels of um, uh, degrees. You've got the foundation degree, which is a two-year and a practical-based course, uh, realistically designed to bridge that gap between the industries and academics. Um, uh, and uh, you've also got your, your third year um, top up and you've got your full degrees in other uh, institutions uh, and they're all slightly different in their methodologies and their outcomes uh, and the people that are produced from it whether it's a production um, uh, type course uh, and fairly practical like a foundation degree or whether it's quite an academic um, uh, course but still related to broadcast or it could be even an engineering course that is related so are you going to differentiate with your your standard um, by course level or or across think, yeah. the range initially we're talking you know first steps here and initially I think we uh, Graham, Graham keeps telling me this Do I, yeah okay. I think we don't care <laughs> what, where your I think, course comes yeah from. I think we don't need to know uh, if you yes. say okay here's an ITTP approved skills scheme here's mm -hmm. a list of skills how you teach them is, is your job. You're, you're educational people, you teach. We don't care what you do, so long as you end up here. And we only, only set the, the, the up here's from what the industry is telling us, not, it's not us. Yeah. It's people out there who say, we need this. Barry Cobden and, and the like who say, we need this. 
And we say, OK, well, this is a list of what they want. You hit those standards. How you do it and what you add to it and how you make the student's life better around the edges is up to you. So it is going to be based around skills. Yes. yes. So then the foundation would be probably better. Um, I don't know. Well, it, 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 uh, can I, yeah. Yeah. I think this could be embedded in any course. Yeah. So, yes, you, you will have a perfect uh, platform to embed these skills. But in the same way, a university could, course, could choose to embed these skills, whether they do it in their practical sessions, whether they do it in first year, second year, third year. It's about achieving the level of skills in the course, not when or where they do it. But universities and colleges have a big interest in get their students getting jobs. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So that's really important, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, who's got the microphone? Yeah, if if, it, yeah, if right. um, I have Darren Long and um, what's his name from BT Sport? Andy, Andy, Andy Beal. Beal saying these are the list of skills <coughs> that ITTP think are right and they know because of this. They're very powerful people and yeah, they're yeah. very strong on backing it. So that's why they were standing up here first thing this morning. <laughs> So you've got that link through at that point, haven't you, where they, you know, they're saying, the big, big players are playing and saying, this is the right thing to do. Okay. okay. The only other thing then is, is that, that you bring these skills out and uh, as many of, of uh, the academics here will say, sometimes to change a curriculum can take over a year, sometimes two years, sometimes yeah, a little yes. longer, depending on the institutions and uh, yeah. what... Yeah. Uh, what area and, uh, and position the, the actual course is in. Understood. I understand that because Susan's always telling us. But actually, that's not our problem, is it? <laughs> that's not our problem. Uh, if I say, here I am, I'm the industry, because behind me are serious people. I am the industry. Here is a list that these serious people gave me of skills that they want. How you do it and your problems in delivering is your problem, not the industry's. So when do the industry want this? They won it yesterday. Okay. Right. I thought that would be the answer. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, here. Thank you. And uh, if you could give the mic to the gentleman at the back next after okay. this. Uh, Phil Middleham, Stratford College again. Um, we have those qualifications now. I actually teach on the qualification. It's level five qualification. Uh, we look at Ohm's Law and everything that is you know, practical um, and helpful for students. Terminology, a vocabulary that we so glibly use and, and forget that people don't understand what we're saying. I've learned one today that I didn't <coughs> even know. Um, so that's going to be quite useful to take back. Uh, but you know, it absolutely exists. The thing is, getting the right people to actually bring that knowledge to the table and teach the students. That's the existing problem that I have as I sit here now. And I almost couldn't come today because we were so short of staff that actually could cover for what I normally teach. Yeah. That is a serious problem in this country. Mm. And may not be just because, you know, there's a shortage of people to do it, because there, there isn't. It's just that they need a certain level of academic qualification. Yes, I think you, you mentioned that earlier in the... But in it's the fundamental. No, 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 I, I'm happy to talk to it as, a, as I've got a few ideas for you. Uh, and You're there going to come and teach. <laughs> there's there's a, couple, a couple of ways that you can do it. Obviously, as you quite rightly said, even in higher education, more and more institutions are looking for some level of qualification, which would normally be a PGCE or either a member of the Higher Education Institute, HEA which would normally follow your postgraduate certificate in education. So a postgraduate PGCE would normally take a year, which could be done while you are teaching. Um, isn't but, there a point that I seem to remember reading that if you're really old, you, when you've got a if you've got a degree before a certain time, you don't have to have a PG? It is about the, ab it's about the higher education institution. Uh, it is to, down to, to actually you, teach? No, to your vice chancellor. Yes. It's simple, the Board of Governors... But is it different for universities? This is a university, yes, yes. So it's higher education. Because there used to be a thing rather like, well, you know, my, my father never had a proper driving licence, I mean, you know, because yes, yes. they didn't have them <laughs> and all that sort of thing. But it used to be a learning. thing that if you yes. got a degree before a certain date, you could actually teach in a school without in a, a PGSE. There's an awful... You know. A PGC. Uh, yeah. yeah. There's an awful lot of universities that are very, very happy for people to teach without 
postgraduate certificate in education, but more of them are being are looking at their figures and they have to put up their statistics on the website and that says, oh, do you have all qualified staff? So that is why there, there, there is a, definitely a certain amount of box ticking there. Mm -hmm. So they are looking for that. But so that could be one year at the same time as you're actually teaching. An awful lot of institutions will do it like that. No, no, that's what we offer. All right. But I mean, it's still hard to get the people to come and commit to that. To come and commit. The other mm. way that you might think about doing it, if you're actually, if you have a member of staff who is running the module, then you could actually teach it to a certain level and then in bring in guests, guest speakers, to help add colour and flavour and more of the industry practice. And what's actually wonderful about that is not only are your students learning, but you're learning as well. So if it's a layer, an area you're not quite so familiar with, you will actually be developing, it will be personal development as well as development for the students. And then you can embed that into the course. And, and then sometimes it's good just to get the, to, and I think your list of approved people that could do, say, Something about PAs or vision mix yes. would be excellent for that. Yes. Yeah, but of course it costs money and then the colleges will kind of go, well, we can't afford to do that. Well, of course, there's always a cost issue, of course. Yeah. Yes, That's I mean. the big problem. Uh, yeah. OK, can we relinquish the microphone? Sorry, did that, did that, your toy? Did, did that, did that yeah. answer your question? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but is it not no, possible? It I don't think <laughs> we have got the right... I mean, I listen to those students. My heart goes out to them. They've spent a lot of money, and yet their three years at the university didn't seem to really tick all boxes that they expected. And I think that's so sad. Um, mm. And I'm hoping that my students at my college in two years actually could go out into the industry, and they have. So I know it actually works. Mm. But we do it a very different way, and we flex it right to the edge of what we can possibly do. Do you get to in? Make it industry viable. Do you get in professionals from the industry yes, to talk? Course. Yeah. But that would seem to be the way to do it, he said, as a person who does it. I have all the advantages and none of the disadvantages working for Susan because she says, can you teach this? And she knows that I can. I come in, I teach it. And when the student's outside her door half an hour's time saying the world's ending, it's not my problem. <laughs> and that seems a wonderful way of doing it. She gets the advantage of me and then she gets rid of me when she doesn't want me. Goodbye. And that seems a good way of doing things, really. OK. Uh, gentleman at the back, who's got the mic? Yeah. And that's exactly what the drama schools do for, for theatre. Um, oh, it's Nick. Yes. Yeah, a couple of short things. Uh, it's Nick Moran from ALD and Central again. We love you. Um, the, there's, there's a thing called National Occupational Standards, which certainly in the theatre sector, mm. our uh, Creative and Cultural Skills Council spent a lot of government money making sure that we, as an industry, informed those national occupational standards. And there is an expectation that if you are running a course that aims to meet some of those, expe the, 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 uh, those particular standards, that you meet those national occupational standards, that you can demonstrate that you meet them. And certainly, uh, our institution, I know that that's what we map the, the outcomes to. So that's, that's a, a, a very... Uh, organised, formal and funded way in which industry informs the expectations of the courses, the outcomes of the courses uh, okay. at a skills level. Okay, um, next question. Um, at the back there. Yeah. Sorry, if you want. Uh, Neil Garner from Training for TV. Um, I run a small business delivering bespoke training to the industry. We go in and deliver design and deliver courses to meet specific training needs. I think what we're seeing here coming up is the difference between education and training. The fact is that 20 years ago, Skillset did a marvellous job. They documented the skills required for every job in the industry and in doing so made the job of training and teaching and the job for the educators almost impossible because what they discovered was is that in our industry you've got everything from um, you know Steven, Steven Spielberg's epic down to a shopping channel um, sorry or maybe it'd be the other way round I'm not uh, deliberately trying to uh, um, cast aspersions on anybody. But the range of skills and requirements that you have 
was so vast that actually the qualifications they came up with became impossible to get because there was no one place where you could actually do all of the things which everybody wanted people to be able to do. It was the, the ultimate situation of the committee designing the camel. Um, and it, it became totally unworkable. What I'd like to know is that, you know, as somebody who deals with training, which is about getting somebody from A to B, as cost-effectively and as quickly as possible, as opposed to education, which is about spending three years developing people and developing their skills, their abilities, and them as a whole person. How are you going to come up with something better than what we came up with from Skillset, which was an industry initiative? And I know some very, very good operators and senior people who sat on those committees and came up with those, uh, the, the, the working parties that came up with those, those things. But they have to be filtered. And realistically, every employer has their own specific requirements from that. We need this, 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 but we don't need all the rest. How are you going to make that work for, you know, the, the, the sheep dip Sorry, and I do apologise to the university people. But the, the, the sheep dip that is further education and universities, it is there for everybody, trying to cater for all needs across, you know, an entire industry and world. Now, I'd like to say, first of all, going back to the skill set thing, I've looked at the skill set cameraman requirements, and it's 120 pages. And if you know all that, you could work with you know, Steven Spielberg, and, and make a feature film because you were that qualified as a camera because you know 120 pages worth of cameraman skills. And we're not, by any means, um, wanting to measure people at that sort of skill, at that sort of level. We don't want people who can say, oh, I've left university and I can now go and shoot a feature film with Steven Spielberg. We're looking at people who are just entering the industry either through a university or by the Uncle Bob route, as I call it. And we want to, to say to the industry, this person, Bob Smith, has, um, has, has reached the required level of basic skill. So if you want to put this guy as a lighting assistant, a sound assistant, a camera assistant, whatever, he knows what an XLR does. He knows what Ohm's law is. He knows what 13 amp is. You know, so we, we're looking at, at an actual a, a level. So, uh, so when our friends from CTV are looking for a camera assistant, they know that this bloke, Bob Smith, has, will be a good camera assistant because he knows about rigging a camera. He knows about an A-frame. He knows about how a viewfinder goes on top of a camera. He knows what thing to plug in the side. So that's what level we're working to. But isn't there a problem that, um, there's two problems that seem to have been talked about. One is not enough people coming out with the right knowledge, but also the industry's reluctance to train anyone. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, of course mm -hmm. the big people are training people, but that's a drop in the ocean, really. Yes, that's where the politics really comes in, isn't it? Because that's where the time has come for the industry levy to be to come out some way that the industry, those big chaps who were here earlier, actually saying we need to do our duty for society, not just for Sky TV. Now, I would have thought Sky TV actually was the idea because they got pots of money and they also want to be the new BBC. So perhaps they're the people to say, actually, yes. we don't need to just train our people. We can spend a bit of that ginormous amount of money on spending on training a few other people as well. Well, they do call a it a thing. campus. There. Yes, they do. Yes, yes, yes. I think so. Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. Someone said the other week, this is sort of by the way, but that they said that Sky had been setting themselves up over the noughties to be the rival of the BBC, and then they watched the BBC dissolve in front of their eyes. Which is terribly sad. It is really, isn't and it? Another thing that so we're, we're doing is we are consulting the guilds and the associations because they are the people with the uh, personnel in industry being employed in these jobs. And that's why we're going to the likes of Barry and Ian and the GTC to work with them, not us saying these are the skills that we need. It's not our opinion. It's a cross between what the associations need and what industry needs. So we'll hopefully we're drawing that together. Yes. And we really have to be a bit simplistic, frankly, in the end. You know, we cannot be all things to all men and you have to start somewhere. You know, so oh, you've yes. got a little list and you say, OK, we've got a little list. I know you want 25 other things on it. Well, put them there. You know, you add to it. Sorry. Yes. OK, I a couple more questions. Oh, Jan, you want to ask something? Yeah, I've got a 
Yeah. Have a mic. I find all this incredibly fascinating, and of course it's all very correct. One key <coughs> element in training which is missing here, which I find missing in almost all the film schools I have been teaching, and that is music. Mm -hmm. Music as one element, potential element in the structure of a film. Uh, also music as a scripting tool, which is very, very important. And since it's a rights issue, having a great soundtrack on a budget, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, which is cheap uh, and and fantastic. And I think this is something that almost in all film schools, it's just ignored. It's, it's not really taught. Music is something for post-production, you know, sort of like, like Parmesan on pasta. You know, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not true. It's really not true. Yeah. And I, I was surprised that it hasn't been mentioned here either. That is part of a very simple training. It's not brain surgery to get across to a student what he is potentially lacking yeah. in his toolbox. I, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And this is why I asked you to come today with one or the other, because it's the art bit which I think gets lost in the education world. And I would go, when, when I was a lecturer at Ravensbourne, we did a music exercise. I had 12 students. Only two could bar count. You know, and, and I was horrified that out of 10 students, only two could bar count. And, and yet they wanted to be vision mixers, editors, camera, you know. And yet, where was that skill being taught? They weren't going to, it wasn't like a next week at Ravensbourne, we're going to have a whole week of music teaching. You know, that, that was, no, we don't teach music. We teach, you know, black boxes and MPEG-4 encoding or whatever, you know what I mean? So, and we don't teach art. We don't, you know, we don't want to know people to, you know, we have cameramen. They don't want to know about art. They want to be cameramen. They don't want, you know. So you're absolutely right. And I think this, is, you, this does frustrate me, that things like art, which includes music, somehow is like, oh, they want to talk about black magic cameras or Sony cameras or uh, DTA converters or whatever. You know what I mean? So you're absolutely right, Anne, yeah. OK, uh, just there, yep. I'm Claire Simmons from Coventry University. Um, I've had the, um, the pleasure of working with quite a few accreditation councils in my time teaching in a media department. So I've, uh, I've been through three different types of accreditation in the media industries, all of them different. And it seems to me that your biggest problem is that you've got, you can't have a one-size-fits-all. You've got different strands that need to be satisfied and you need to get the industries taking a bit more responsibility of talking to the training providers like FE colleges and universities. And one of the suggestions I would offer, um, which I think could work, um, is instead of trying to, to be everything to, to everybody in one institution, what you can do is offer an ITTP certificate um, and you, you would need to have a selection of guidelines depending on what it is that you need. So you'd have your cameramen, you'd have your sparkers, you'd have your sound people, and then you offer the accreditation to the industry in just that one strand, yes. but it carries the overarching umbrella yeah. of the ITTP mm. logo. So that, yeah, that's that, what we're doing. Absolutely, we're going, you, yes, you're yeah. absolutely right, this is what we're, we're actually what we're aiming doing. to do. Yeah. So you, we have you no know, sound, lighting, cameras, vision mixing, editing, da -da -da, makeup, all, yeah, absolutely right. It, it, we're on that on the same page. Okay, so one more. It's, 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 an, it's like an accreditation. You don't have to be at any particular age to pass a driving test. So it's exactly the same. It's about having the skills. Yes. I'll let lovely lady down here again. Yeah. Yeah. So are you envisioning that this would go hand in hand with, say, a... Are you envisioning that this would go hand in hand with, like, a media studies A-level course? That no. your list of skills can be ticked off through a national standardized... No. No. no, this is an entirely separate... No. Media studies is not a word we allow, or not a phrase we allow to pass our lips for a start. Um, but apart from that... Uh, can I uh, ask why? Yes, because media studies... How can we put this? Media studies is about studying the media, not studying the means of producing the media. Except that generally. there is a requirement on that syllabus of creating a product. Well, that uh, may be so, but generally, uh, the, pe well, the people who are wanted in the industry to be broadcast engineers, cameramen, la-di-da, 
the, the arty bit at the other end, the sort of how is EastEnders this year compared to EastEnders in 1987 is not terribly relevant to their lifestyle or very interesting, but not terribly relevant. And so media studies tends to lean in the wrong direction for what we're talking about. But apart from that, again, I say we don't care. It doesn't matter. What matters but, but is here is a list of skills. But you do care because you just said that I couldn't pair it with what we're already teaching no, no. at secondary school. What I'm saying school. is here is a list of skills which you asked me for earlier, and you know, contact us later or you know, email us, and we'll give you the list. It's it's a perfectly reasonable list. Um, you can see the list. Developing. We're still working on it, but you can see where it's got to, um, and it's it's perfectly reasonable. Barry Cobden spent hours on the sound. We spent hours on cameras, mm -hmm. and you know, it's a it's a perfectly good list. It needs more work, but it's getting there. Um, it doesn't matter how you hit Ohm's law. Again, I, I'm sorry to go on about Ohm's law, but it's top of the list. It's a simple, you're basic... Not, you're not the end, really. Well, I know, it's a sim <laughs> the simplest basic thing in the world that we learn, you know, it's almost like you learned to ride a bike so long ago you can't remember how, <laughs> except that, you know, you ask people and they don't know it. Uh, but, you know, the, the list consists of a list of things that it would be really useful for us. To, for, it, that's what I want out of people. Not what I want, but what they want out of people. How you deliver that as educational people, that's what you educate. That's, that's how you... We are not educators, you are. If you see what I mean. That's why I'm suggesting that if your list is something that we can then pair with the syllabus whatever you want. that we're already whatever you want. Yes. Yeah. 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 Whatever you want. And that's yeah. within yeah. the science curriculum that uh, GCSE yeah. Yeah. students whatever are studying, you want. we highlight that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because also, I, I said to before, we want the Uncle Bob person as well. Because there are people who may be 30 years old who want to become a sound man, and Uncle Bob is a sound man. So they spend three years with Uncle Bob learning all about sound. So they, they, want, they want to be a sound recorder. So they may come from a totally different route. And so, that, so they, they say, oh, I want to be an ITTP-approved sound recordist, and Uncle Bob taught me, so they can then get the, the approved certificate, even though they come from Uncle Bob. Thank you. Isn't that right, Bob? <laughs> uh, hang on. Yeah, Barry. Thank you. It's Barry Cobden again, but I'm sitting here with my trainer's hat on. And I just wanted to address something that was said earlier about can you catch up with the changes in technology? Um, the basic stuff, here's a microphone, here's a light, here's a camera. As somebody once said, I kind of changed the laws of physics, Captain. My grandfather was a recordist in the 1930s. He's in the IMDb, I'm in the IMDb. It doesn't matter whether you've got a HD camera or a, a CPS Emitron. It's got a focus handle on one side, a viewfinder on the top, and you can frame with it. And you can learn how to frame with it, and you can learn how to frame with it to avoid the microphone in the top of shot. And you can do all of that stuff in five minutes. So it doesn't have to be the latest expensive high definition kit no. to get those sorts of basics across. And any, any <clears throat> excuse me, and any academic institution that wanted to begin doing that now, and perhaps for whatever reason they haven't been, they can start with the, with the simplest of stuff. And one of us industry professionals will come in and show you, and you will validate us. So we're not qualified, but you will validate us as trainers for that particular piece of kit that you uh, piece of course that you've got in your course. Uh, directory, and that will be imparted. So there's, there's nothing to stop schools and colleges, as well as um, HE um, institutions, from adding your certificate Not to their list of extra that? certificates, so oh, to speak, it's that just people the, can the, get. The Elstree is, a, is a, a fairly specialist school, and mm -hmm. most schools aren't, so it's likely mm -hmm. that you know, your average grammar school or, or comprehensive or whatever is not particularly going to be interested in that. But why not? Why not? Just picking up again, I find it really frustrating when I, when I'm, I ask a student, if you put a times two in a 140 millimeter lens, what do you end up with? And so many students can't work out two times 140. Now, is that basic fundamentals which you know, I think we're lacking within the industry. Well, apparently mental arithmetic is old-fashioned. Well, see. OK, but then, I mean, or if you've got a 100-metre drum, you've got three cables, how do you make a 100-metre length out of you know, <laughs> two, three or four different cable lengths? I, I mean, know. is that fundamentals which students don't seem to be able to understand? Is it 70 or 30 or 20 or 40, whatever? You know, and is that fundamentals that, you know, is, 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 is part of the problem? I think we're going to let uh, Graham um, sum up. Now, oh, okay. Thank you. And um, <laughs> before um, he, he does that, um, I should point out that some of us are going on to the Sony reception. And if you want to do that, you need to go um, out there um, where, the, uh, where you had the coffee and assemble. There's a, the Sony banner will still be there because where it is is about five minutes walk away. It's vast Pinewood, so it's 
It's a little walk to get there. Last year it was pouring with rain, so count Here yourself lucky that it's <laughs> not too bad, I hope, this year. Um, anyway, Graham, please uh, give us your thoughts. Well, yeah, let's finish off then. Um, again, a big thank you for all for coming. I hope you found the day really interesting and, and provocative and go away with lots of food for thoughts and ideas. Um, Please keep contacting us and 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 making and renewing the contact you've made today to, to know where, on the where we um, we go forward. And I think there's a website on, on the screen. Or on something. the screen, there are, are there, on the screen. Uh, Cats made us up. Oh, I think there's the gener generic email address, and then there's our individual email address because people kept on asking me during the day, "What's your email address?" and you know, it's long and complicated, but it's there on the screen now. If you go to info.whatsit or Graham, you, they both get Graham, basically. Yeah, so um, I'll be inundated with emails. But, Su <laughs> but Susan and I are also on the list yeah, now. So Feel free to cause, because how else are we going to carry on from here? Yeah. Sorry, Graham. Yeah, so do keep in touch. Um, and again, a big thank you for all the hard work from um, students, um, students for running around and doing all the organisation. Um, thank you for all our sponsors, again, for making this today possible. And for everybody who's worked so hard in, in making today's thing, um, today event happening. Um, a big thank you for um, Roz again, who's done a sterling job. Um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a sterling job in asking all these very awkward questions and, and keeping us media people um, under control. Um, anything else I want to say? Um, anything else I want to say? No. So, so thank you again for coming. Um, do enjoy Sonny. They, there is um, um, food and drink um, with Sonny. And um, I hope we might all see you again, um, possibly in the same place next year sometime. So. And, and talk to us. You know, how are we going to get this done without you from now on? We can't. We need you to go, why the hell aren't you doing so-and-so? So please talk to us. Yeah. Thank yeah, you all very I, much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, indeed. That was, that was good. Good job.